to the Rage and Rape Podcast, episode 2, live from the VWU uh, channel. I am here with Jason. Hello, Jason. everyone. <laughs> and we are live from my studio. Shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, my uh, backyard. <laughs> here in my beautiful home of uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. So, it, it's very luxurious, by the way. It's very big. Mm -hmm. it's a ring and everything. Yeah, I, 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 see, I see the, I see a ring over there, and, uh, I see a couple of old, uh, uh, Super Japan, uh, posters, I mean, like, the banners and stuff are all over the place, and I see some ring aprons. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, let's see, some of those ring aprons are from Super Japan, uh, one, the other ring apron is from there's a GWM apron ah over there yeah and another one is from <laughs> this that one's a very special one that one is from uh, a promotion here in Louisiana that I took and basically in a not a me and plucky drinking we just kind of got petty and stole that ring apron because the promoter gypped us out of money <laughs> You stole it. <laughs> <laughs> we also kind of fucked up the guy's car too, but you know, but you know, you know. You know. <laughs> yeah, it, that, that was a that was a really good night. Um, that's what happens when you jip us out of fifty dollars when we you know we drove all the way to fuck there and y'all you didn't want to reimburse us in gas, so you know we took your ring aprons. <laughs> 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 Though, you know, I mean, we were generous. If it was like Taggart or, or, or God forbid, Jackie, it would have been a different story. <laughs> oh, from the stories I've you've told me before, those two would have beat the fuck out of him. Jack? Especially so, Jackie. No, yeah, Jackie did not fucking play around. I mean, and, nicest guy in the world, but you jip him out of fucking money? Oh, boy. Yeah, no, he didn't play that. He didn't. He was the type of guy that did not play that bullshit of anybody trying to um, alpha male him. Mm -hmm. And he definitely didn't play the fact of somebody jipping him out of money. He, uh, I remember his wife was real sick and he needed extra money for her treatments. And the guy decided to go back on his word. Mm-hmm. And this is they they filled the damn building up. It, it the the house jumped thirty percent, and he paid him less, and he paid him the same amount he paid him the first time. Even Ooh. though the house jumped about thirty percent, he is like, "Where's the rest of my money?" And he was like, "Oh well, you know, we had to." Jackie's like, "Okay." Jackie went to his truck, got. Hitched his hitched the guy's car. Found the guy's car. Hitched that shit to the back of his truck. Sped off and just with one big turn, slung that fucking car into the path of traffic where an AT wheeler was coming through. Jesus. And fucking demolished his car. <laughs> and he just stared at him and he's like, either pay me either pay me what I'm owed, or that's you next. <laughs> Man, some bitch paid him extra. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I get it. That's <laughs> That was his wife. That was his. That was his beloved, his high school sweetheart. He'd be damned if she was gonna get sick. But <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> uh, 
right, before we get more into going down memory lane, uh, I guess we uh, we we gonna you know talk about VW's most recent event that was Prestige Seven. Oh God, yeah, that was that was a hell of a show. A lot of stuff happened. A lot of uh, good and a lot of bad. Yeah. One of the good things, Jamal Bedlam is finally the VW World Heavyweight Champion. Long time coming. Uh, very long time coming. I remember a lot of people were very much of the idea that it was going to be Jamal that would carry the torch and truly bring uh, the VW to a higher place, not only taking over uh, Malik's role, but taking it and just going beyond with it. Yeah. Because that was everybody's uh, that was everybody's idea. And it finally happened. He beat Roman for it. And hell of a match. Oh yeah, that was a that was one hellacious match. Um, and of course, we got to give our love out there to GMR for making sure uh, Solo Sokoa didn't get involved. <laughs> yep, that was... You know, congratulations, GMR. I see a lot of good things in your future, you wild son of a bitch. Um, it was really good of him to do that. And, yeah, I think, I think GMR has just, I think, submitted his place as a guy who is going to really start coming up around in the VWC mm -hmm. and I uh, can't wait to see what he does more I love I love I love the crazy sons of bitches in the ring yeah cuz I I'm crazy my damn self yeah <laughs> I mean, I look it but I'm crazy as, I can be just as crazy as anybody else <laughs> and of course um we saw, um, and this didn't happen exactly on the show itself. It happened down on the it happened in, during the countdown show. We saw what happened to James Needham when the House of Servers pretty much bludgeoned both him and Hit Kid. Um, yeah, Needham pretty much had internal bleeding. Hit Kid uh, was able to. He 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 got an ass kicking, but he didn't get the worst of it. He came out of it with a concussion. Yeah, he. Uh, I don't even call it lucky, but he got lucky compared to his brother. Uh, yeah. Who? Uh, damn. You know. You know how you you know how some happens. Yeah. And you don't want to say I told you so because mm -hmm. you know you tell them like the day I tell you I I told you so I'm gonna wish I didn't. Mm -hmm. That was one of those moments where I wished I didn't say it because I knew that was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people deep down knew that was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Because, no, oh, man, like, the situation is fucked, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And, personally, one innocent person is getting hurt in all this, and that's Picasso. Yeah, I mean, especially what happened during during the show when, when she got attacked by her own mother. Which, uh, yeah, no, that was... I was fucked, you know, and it it was a fuck situation no matter what. Um, but Tia kept her is keeping her away from that, and that's probably the best right now. Yeah, because I'm sorry. I think right now, at that moment, I think the only people I can truly trust with Mikasa's health and care is literally 
anybody that's not emotionally compromised when it comes to Char when it comes around Charles Schultz. I don't trust a single person. Yeah. I don't trust a, I don't trust neither one of them to do right by her. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't. Like Tia I'm wary on Alex. Even though he's trying, I'm still wary on him. Yeah. Um and no offense though, Seiko and her family, but I'm mm, I don't know. They're a little too caught up in their own stuff themselves, and honestly, I don't think now is the time. As much as Yuki is getting as much as Yuki wants to be there for Mikasa, personally, I think they need to step away. Mm -hmm. Because right now they they are at they are putting too much on their head, especially Yuki. Yuki's putting too much on herself. Yeah, and she's young, and while I get that a lot of people have said and feel a certain way personally like I said there's only one or two people in this entire situation I can trust with Mikasa's life and it is not and and I, I pointed out who those two are yeah I said you know Tia is one of them Yuki to an extent but again I feel like that when Yuki can get through what she's going through yeah but Tia is probably one of the few you know, she let her stay with Oseko and her family, which I think is one of the best things she could do at this point. Mm -hmm. But I don't trust nobody else with her, with Mikasa's life, well-being and livelihood. Because I, I'm sorry, where was that? Where was that care beforehand? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Where was that care for her, her livelihood back then? Mm -hmm. when y'all were forcing this child like she needs to make a decision she needs to do y'all act like like I like how the majority of those people who do that act like they've never act like it's so easy to uh... it, it's it's a situation like when, he, when if it came to like a friend you could do that switch like just like that but when it comes to family Especially your parents, and you don't have a history of, of you know, of abuse. abuse or anything like that. And she, yeah, and she generally loves her parents. It's you just can't expect Mikasa to just be like, okay, I'm gonna fight my parents. You you can't. It's not that easy. Right. And anyone who's anyone who's making it out to be are fucking stupid. Right. Because everybody just expect, and that's the fuck, and that's like I think the most disgusting part about it, to me personally, is that everybody has this weird fucking assumption that Charles and Alicia are abusive towards Mikasa, because this is the, the because this time it's like Charles is so lost in his own festering hatred mm -hmm. and anger and bitterness, and he's just like fuck the world and everybody in it that he's ignoring the number one thing that's been keeping him you know keeping him on this planet mm -hmm. because I mean let's be honest Charles Schultz is a man that walked around back Charles Schultz was a guy that walked around with a with a smile on his face, but behind that smile, he was like counting the twenty-two reasons why. If you know what I mean. Yeah. And nobody did shit to really fix that or try to help. It was either let's make jokes about it or oh, get over yourself or you know something like that. Just a bunch of fucking trauma Olympics for no fucking reason. It always it always seems like like when Char anytime Charles ever brought up his trauma or anything like that, or anyone try to bring it up, it's always like, well, such and such has this, so why is he acting like this, or such and such? Because people deal with trauma differently, you fucks. Like everybody has a different way of dealing with some of the shit, and 
the problem is, is like, and, I, and I've known even, and this is coming from somebody that's been around this business since the late seventies, early eighties. Mental health has always been like that really touchy subject because nobody knows how to really handle it mm -hmm. and to this day even with the evolution of mental health and people trying to care much about mental health people still kind of want to throw this idea of hey they go through this but they're perfectly fine so what's his excuse and they still do the same shit, and y'all... And it's like, you fucking wonder why most people are fucked up and they never get the proper help they need because nobody bothers to sit down and try. And, again, I was like, fuck, here, I'll, I'll say what you said on that, uh... I'll, I'll say what you said back then when you were talking in that match with him and Zayn. Mm-hmm. To which Zahaya just kind of, again, just kind of heartlessly fucking ignored all that shit because he's so emotionally detached to fucking everything, you know? Well, yeah, it, if you heard me on that booth and everything like that, I I was laying into Zahaya. And I. You were. And again, he's just. And again, it's that same. I'm going to say it now. This is the same. Like, he, he basically acted the same way when he. when he was trying to sue Malik and take Malik for everything because he got fucking angry because his shit got exposed and again he's coming off with that same emotional detachment and it's like and I've heard the shit he said and I'm, I'm just sitting there going and I, I laugh because I'm like oh like you he's, like, no, he's a piece of shit for years I know what kind of person he is oh like you I mean, a lot, a lot of shit that he was saying about Charles. You, there, all, there's always, there's that old saying, when you point your fingers at someone, there's three pointing right back at you. Right, and that's that's the crazy thing. It's like, dude, and it's funny he says that when everybody knows now all the shit he was hiding before. Yeah. And before anyone, you know, in the comment section thinking we're trying to defend Charles for his actions or anything like that. No, this entire situation isn't as black and white as it may seem or as anyone's trying to propagate. There's so much fucking gray to this. It's... There's always... Been, there, when it comes to the whole thing of Charles Schultz and the VW, it's never been black. That shit's been gray as hell since the beginning. Like, again, the shit he's doing is fuck. The shit he did to James was fucked beyond belief, but there's also that hint of, it's been coming for a while, and even James knew it, but James also tried to at least, in his own dry way, admit he fucked up. Now, did Mikasa have it? Now, did Mikasa have to be dragged to this shit again? No, she didn't have to be dragged through this. She didn't have to be dragged through a lot of it. But she, but she ended up getting dragged into it one way or another. And this time, unfortunately, well, this time it's from people that she's had history with. It's from her own parents. Mm -hmm. With Charles basically not even remembering her existence and Alicia putting her through a flaming table. Like, and I don't know, man. Part of me just kind of can't help but feel angry when I hear people say, oh, how dare they do this to her? And I'm just sitting here going, fuck y'all. Y'all didn't give a shit before. Y'all gonna now give a shit now because that happened? Oh, now y'all have a conscience? Oh, now y'all... Fuck off. I'm sorry, ooh, I can hate it. I can hate it. Cause... If if anything, we, I, I think when it does come to Charles, I think a lot of emotions do come up. Uh, I do think, like, in a future episode, I think we do need to just analyze everything that's gone down. But with everything that has happened recently, there's too much emotions going on right now. And I think the best thing to yeah. do is to move on from that. Um, yeah. Before 
we let any anger out and we might say something we, we don't we will regret or we'll never hear the end from. Um, yeah, because God, yeah. But, but yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Prestige went off without a hitch. Um, a lot of amazing matches. Saw the return of fucking Duncan Vermil fucking over VWU. Oh, God. Uh, when he helped uh, unintentionally or intentionally, I don't know. Don't know why he's back, but the reason why Bowser beat Claudio is because of Duncan. I think he's. I think Duncan did that just because he wants to fight Claudio. Yeah. Honestly, I do know Vin. I do know Vin. You know, had that rare moment of, oh fuck, this guy again. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's, there's not a lot to take. It, there's not much to take Vin, to make a guy like Vin just kind of like roll his eyes or show any kind of crack in his uh, his facade. But I I swear when he saw Duncan Vermeil, he just sat there going mm-hmm. like he actually had to take a breath and walk around. <laughs> A lot of history with those two. A lot of history. Uh, but but not a lot of the, what happened to me is good. Uh, we have uh, insurgency coming up. That that's looking yeah. To, yeah, that's looking to be good in Detroit. Motor City. I've been to Detroit in a while. I think the last time I went to Detroit was uh, for a Kiss concert. <laughs> Kid you not, I went to Detroit for a Kiss concert. It was one of my uh, anniversary gifts to Inko because Inko is a huge Kiss fan. <laughs> now speaking of Inko, no, oh, here we go. I I think he knew this this uh, was coming. Yeah, I, I've been I've been. Pu- you know, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not. Off on it I, I'm not gonna be like good everybody. I'm not gonna be like the others and try to gaslight you or anything like that because when that happened, there was a lot of gaslight lighting. I'm just letting it be known. Uh, yeah. not, not by me. <laughs> but, I know. Um, but what is that situation going on? I mean, have you talked to her since? Like, wh- what have you found out since? Since all that happened. Well, besides the fact that was an awkward ass ride home after that. Well, you know, besides the uh, awkward ride home that we both had to take because we both drove together, I, I still to this day don't know how the fuck that came out. But Inko has always had this thing where she she'll stay away. But if she sees something that interests her or she feels like someone could lend, could need a helping hand with, she will go for it. Um, from what I know, the thing with Lacey and the Glocks, period. I remember that Inko went to a few um, SRW shows. Mm-hmm. So she went to a few of the events. And she remembered the blocks. And she always, like, felt that she always felt something unique about them. Like, she get she gets those, those, those moments where she could just remember way back when. Yeah. And then I know for a fact with Lacey with Lacey I think it was just she feels like that was one that just slipped through the cracks. And she and felt like and and she and she made it very clear to me I think me she goes I'm not trying to take her away from anybody. That was not my intention. But my intention was to obviously help her 
with her career. Yeah. Because Lacey, as much as she likes being part of the Rana Poor Rebels, she's never had a problem with Revy or Kieva, but at the same time, I you at the same time there's some frustration there. You know? And Inko can see it. So I know that she talked to a lot of people. I know she talked to the two in question. Both Cave and Revy. Yeah. She she told me it's just like I had I had meetings with him. She and she um she didn't like ask for permission either. She literally fa- she literally went she literally would just went out one night to see where Rebecca or Revy was mm-hmm. and pulled Revy to a private table, told her, call Kieva. Revy did. And she just let it and she just basically said her piece and said I know y'all both care for Lacey, so here's what's gonna happen. And she just, you know, put it down like that. Yeah. So they agreed. They had no problem with it. And Lacey and the blocks along with Inko as their uh their mentor, their helper, their 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 uh you could say a print their uh teacher yeah. in a sense. She created the Neo Atrocious Alliance, which is a play on her time and uh, her time and Eagle, which is the Japanese promotion, which is the uh, the uh, Joshi promotion that she got her start in. Yeah, and she be- and and it and she became part of that that version of the Atrocious Alliance mm-hmm. with uh, with a woman that became her mother figure. Her sister figure and her teacher all in one. Yeah. And uh Demon Demon Ryoko, that was her name. Yeah. So she's basically trying to do for Lacey what uh Demon Ryoko did for her. You know, and, and that that name sounds I I I, I know about Demon. Uh, which we'll we'll get to her talk about her in a bit, but just just go on about this. Yeah. So she told me like, I'm not gonna wrestle. Don't worry. I gave her a look. She goes, I promise I'm not gonna wrestle. I'm not going to. Just going to be their teacher. They're gonna be doing the heavy lifting. I don't. I'm not gonna work. Don't worry. You know. Because. <laughs> I'm fucking terrified if her ass says I want to wrestle again. Because <laughs> if she says that, then she's going to start pulling me into the fucking ring. And she's going to be like, your back's been, you was like, your back's been good since 97. <laughs> What's stopping you from coming back? And I'm just like, look, you know, we have this ar- these arguments before. I'm content where I'm at now, you know. I'm content in the position I'm in. I get that itch every now and again, mm-hmm. but I'm content. Inko, she has that moment too where she's content, but then she'll also have those days where she's like itching, and she's just like, I could probably come back. And I'm just like, don't be like. And I'm just like, you remember God is Maya? Do not be like God is Maya where you're on your 14th fucking retirement. <laughs> she used to roll her eyes when her old idol partner used to say, "Oh, I'm gonna retire." Two months later, she's on. <laughs> she does. She says she's gonna retire. Does a retirement tour that lasts, and then her retirement lasts for about a year, and then she comes back. <laughs> God is my. I remember. <laughs> Inko used to make the joke. 
She's got more retirement tours than I got championships. <laughs> <laughs> and it became a joke. It's like a little joke among among the fucking community in Japan. Like there's there's a picture of her and she's like retirement. It's like days since retiring. And they put it like one and then they show her in a return they show her making her big return and then and then it's like X'd out with the top, with the caption. God damn it. You know <laughs> So I used to get her, I say, like, don't be like her. You know? If you're retired, stay retired. But she, but she told me, she's like, I'm not gonna wrestle. I'm not. Even though I know deep down she wants to, because she looks at the comp, she looks at the women now, and she's just like, oh, I can do this with her, I can do that with her. But no, 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 no. How? Like, she can't watch Oseko matches. <laughs> No, she can't. She legit can't watch Oseko matches. You know how... <laughs> you know how Oseko would literally be in Gorilla for Saito matches and she'd just be sitting there? Mm -hmm. And just... And just so intent. She looks like a... She looks like a six-year-old at the TV again. <laughs> That's Inko. Inko would just be sitting with a... With a with a goddamn, with a Miller light in her hand, and she's just be like, "I can do this. I can, do, I can do that." Oh man, she could probably counter that. We could do like a a vet here, duh, duh, duh. and then no, no, no. Like she would fight herself because <laughs> she, because she's like, I promised myself, and I promised my husband. I'm not going to go back in the ring. No. So, fun days at the house of Jackson, you know. <laughs> but that's like the whole deal. Um, she just wanted to help the Glocks and Lacey out. And she wanted to give them the proper run that they, that she felt they should have had for the longest time. You know, yeah. She wa she wanted to give Lacey that 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 path to make her what she always wanted to be, and that is the queen of ultraviolence. You know, mm -hmm. and she wanted to make the Glocks the the anarchist the the anarchist the chaos anarchist uh, death machines they've always wanted to be. So she's given them that opportunity, and that's why she brought the Neo Atrocious Alliance, and she made it with them in, in mind. And you know, earlier you were you were talking about about uh, her mentor Demon. Uh, I was talking not too long ago because her name got brought up. Uh, I was talking with, you know, a Bobby Idol, baby. Because, <laughs> apart from Ego, an another Joshi promotion um, that was around during that time was Joshi All-Stars. Um, that was where, when she wasn't working in America, where she would be working at in Japan, when she wasn't, you know, a manager, that's where Baby Doll was. Yep. Yeah. Uh, under her uh, mother uh, persona, mm -hmm. which I've seen some of her vignettes as look when when she's baby doll when she was baby doll she you know she's just you know she she's coming down in skates and everything like that a little mini dress with those little pigtails and stuff like that you know looking something from out of the fifties with Bobby and everything like that it was during uh, right after he got unmasked. Um, when he was, <coughs> when he was a uh, star writer, which, yeah, which uh, for those who don't know, Bobby's original gimmick or persona in wrestling was a uh, star writer, and he wore a mask, and he fucking hated the thing. <laughs> he hated that. He hated it so damn much. <laughs> but he would beg, 
He'd beg people to put him in a, a Lucha Dare Poise to smash. <laughs> Every show. But, well, I've seen his match as a Star Rider, and good God, he was, the when he's Bobby Idol versus when he's uh, Star Rider, it's like completely two different wrestlers. Like, yeah. like definitely his younger younger days, he was very innovative as Star Rider. Uh, I've seen a lot of guys who who uh, who have ever, who have even mimic some of the stuff he he's done and they probably didn't even know they're mimicking Bobby. <laughs> but Oh my god. But but it was but but back to Bobby back when he you know he came on mask and he went heel and he had uh baby doll with him and they and he had that cool leather jacket with the uh with the blonde uh mullet and everything like that. Yeah. Looking like he did look like a greaser, and they used, and they used to mock him for it. So he said, "Fuck it, I'll embrace it." Yeah, I mean that's what's it during uh, uh, Brian Barnett uh, and uh, and the vines uh, and when they were doing their whole uh, biker, not biker, their greaser look. Raptor, uh, they did their you know seventies throwback, and they did the eighties throwback. Yeah. That look was the same look Bobby had, uh, but he had a mu- he had a mullet. <laughs> well, I mean, Alex now has Alex kind of fashioned this shit as a mullet now. So yeah, <laughs> it's a throwback to the, it's a throwback to Bobby. But yeah, Bobby had that that big mullet and everything like that, and it was curly as hell. Um, and but and, you know, baby doll came out with them and everything like that. Had the little poodle on her skirt and everything like that. That's her as baby doll. As mother, she is absolutely terrifying. Complete tonal shift, complete 180 in personality. She wore... It was... Very... I would I would almost compare it to Kevin Sullivan, but I think she took it up a notch. Compared to what Kevin Sullivan did. With her cult. The cult. Kevin, here's the thing. Kevin hinted. But there was no hints. She legit. <laughs> and she. And what was. So, and, and let me tell you how ingenious she was, right? Mm-hmm. She, so. When the whole satanic panic shit started hitting. Mm-hmm. She was like. I know what I'm going to do. So she took full advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And didn't, and and then like, she didn't, there was no hints. She would, she would actually get books and study up on all the different types. Like she, she would study religion. She was studying religion in her, in her little room. So she can like remember names and everything, and she's like, "I can use this, and it sounds it sounds demonic enough. They'll believe it." <laughs> so then, then she comes out talking about like, "I am the," and I remember, <laughs> fuck, she said, "I'm the, I am the lost, I am the lost daughter, of, I am the lost daughter to the heir of, of Goetian, of the, to the heir of Goetia." And it was like, what the fuck? It scared the shit out of people. And it, and and that poor Japanese audience, Jesus Christ. <laughs> they looked like they had a fucking heart attack half the time with her. And the thing is, a lot of people t- still to this day, when I tell them mother and baby doll were the same person, they were like, uh-uh. Get the fuck out of here. You know... Hey, pluck it for pluck it before he passed. Yeah, didn't know baby doll and baby doll and mother were the same. <laughs> Cause he he used to go to Bobby's house for barbecues and shit, and he met baby doll. He's like, that's the sweetest woman in the world, Bobby. You are a lucky son of a bitch to have a woman like that. Uh, and then on the other hand, if we, he did a show in Japan and mother was there, he'd be like, Jesus, keep that fucking. 
Keep that demon away from me. Yes. <laughs> like, does she got a fuck? Does she got that ceremonial dagger with her? She got that shit. Uh, I'm going to church tomorrow. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she made people go to church after seeing her matches. <laughs> do you know she made? Ra- do you know she actually made Taggart stop drinking for about a month? <laughs> He made Randall fucking Taggart stop drinking. <laughs> he actually swore off alcohol for a month. With <laughs> after I forget what had happened. I think I think there was an encounter she had. I think it was supposed to be an in-ring encounter. Yeah, it was. It was an in-ring encounter because they were doing this thing where it was her cult. Mm-hmm. And they decided they were gonna, I think, make a thing where she was gonna use, she was gonna have men, men, because it's usually just an all woman thing, right? Yeah. So they decided, well, maybe we can use, we can get this one guy, and she can do something with him, and because they put faith in her like that. So they had a tag team with one of these me- these cult- these uh, members. He was a he was a big motherfucker, by the way. Came from uh, came from West Texas. Six eight, three twenty five, just fucking built for tough looking some bitch. He used to go by, and he used to go by. Uh, he used to go by Hayes. So she called him. Set. So she was like, so. Oh boy, this shit. I still remember it. she got oh boy she almost got banned off of Japanese television for this shit. <laughs> she does a she does a ritual. Aw oh, shit. <laughs> Snakes and fucking everything else. She takes a syringe, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing in it, but she makes it look like there's some in it, and she's like, and and there and and in the back you hear people in dark robes chanting in tongues, you know, and she, and and it's like this POV camera shot, and she stares down, and she says, "You will be the reckoning that this world truly desires. You will be the final. So- you will be." Our solution towards the oncoming plague that will destroy this world. And she takes this fucking. <laughs> she took like a dead wasp, but they made it look like it was alive. Yeah. And it poked. It poked into his neck. And then she just like injected him with like her uh, her her. her uh, it, it was like a a hallucinogen of sort with rattlesnake venom and shit. And she said, "I call this the cherry on top." And she just, and then once she did it, she's like, Goetia welcomes you to the fold, my child. Samael, raise and hear your mistress's voice. Raise and do mother's bidding. Bring the troubling bells of hell towards these cattle and he raises up this fucker had dog color dog eye contact lenses fangs and he's just staring menacingly in the fucking camera with blood coming out of his mouth they almost got banned off (laughs) (laughs) they almost got banned because it it looked satanic and what made it worse she was using pentagrams right Mm -hmm. so then they introduce him, Taggart, uh, and they tag with Taggart. Taggart, you know, being Taggart at the time, mm-hmm. turns on the guy. Now, here's where, where, um, you know, you respect Taggart. You know, Taggart had those moments where he liked to uh, be his own worst enemy sometimes, you know? Yeah. This was the guy's first big opportunity, and Taggart buried him. 
And he wasn't even faced him. Mm -hmm. He was a partner. And Taggart buried him. Just killed him right then and there. It, and it ruined Baby Doll's chances to do anything and strengthen the cult she had with male and with anybody male. And I remember they were in the middle of the ring. And she, and you know, and the mother character, she's staring at Taggart, and Taggart's staring back. And he gets closer to her. And it's like, he's not going to, right? And so, that's when uh, Ray, this that's when Hayes comes in. Yeah. And he tries to attack Taggart. And so the angle was he was going to do that, and then, then uh, Baby Doll's going to jump on him. And try to claw at him and stuff. Yeah. She flips the script. Because at this point, she's like irritated. Because Taggart did some shit that she didn't like. So instead of doing the angle of grabbing him. And trying to go at his eyes and shit. She bit him in the ear. Dope. Just, just took a chunk of his ear. It's, what the fuck? And he yanked her off. And slammed her down. And he checked his ear. He was like, what the fuck? And then before he knows it, here comes Mother with the fucking Kandar dagger. That was her, that was her weapon of choice because it was like a, a ceremonial dagger that was gimmicked, right? Yeah. Running like a banshee out of hell at him. <laughs> and Taggart, uncharacter like, and Taggart, uncharacteristically just gets the fuck out of the ring. <laughs> Tiger never gets out of the ring for nobody. He got out that ring so damn quick. And she came down with the dagger. She... That shit was so sharp. She... She... she Like, the, that dagger was so damn sharp. She took the middle rope out. <laughs> and Tiger was looking at her... Trying to keep his composure and character, but he's bleeding out of the air. He sees that shit. And he and she, and he sees mother with the, with the dagger up in her hand, just and I remember him saying, I it said, um, it was like I was looking at the eighth circle of hell in her eyes. <laughs> and then he just, and then he he did not, and I remember he just kind of. Stop drinking. Because I think the, one of the main issues was because uh, he was drunk. Because he, cause yeah. Because he, he had a, a a bad habit of drinking during during matches, and that's when he yeah. would fuck people over. Yeah, and so after that, she came barging in, and they were like, "Oh, he bit." She didn't care. She just her little self with all those big guys, and she just threw the dagger. It, it, she just threw that dagger. I don't think she was didn't care what was gonna happen, but that dagger, that dagger hit one of those wooden walls and stuck in there. And she looked at Tag and she says, "You ever fucking drink during a match again? I will neuter you." <laughs> she's like, "You, she's like, do you have any idea how much you fucked me over?" My one opportunity, you ever drink again. I don't give a damn who you think you are. You ever drink again, I'm taking your nuts. Like, she said that. And Tagger was like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you got it. <laughs> he stopped drinking for a month. He went back to drinking, but... Uh, he never drank during. He never drank after before matches ever again. <laughs> but yeah, um, but yet yeah, speaking, you know, you know, you're talking about de demon and everything like that. I remember when, because uh, at that time she was uh, the Joshi All Star Champion, and she went up against Mother, mm -hmm. and yeah. one of the most. This is and this is and this is and this is during the '90s and everything like that. This is early '90s, so you know, it's it's violent. Oh and, yeah. 
And these two beat the holy fuck out of each other. I mean, oh, yeah. I remember, I mean, and the, and the scariest thing was, was when Demon bent a chair over Baby Doll's head, and Baby Doll took it. And, 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 the, and the thing is, Baby Doll was nothing. smaller than her, too. Yeah, no, but that's the... That, that shit was sickening. It was the sick, most sickening shit because she was she literally gave up. She gave up a good chunk of height on on Ryoko and a good seventy five to a hundred pounds on her too. Like she, she didn't look like much, but she was a dangerous. But Baby Doll was a dangerous woman when she wanted to be. Mm hmm. And yeah, she took that chair and it literally bent it around her fucking head, and Baby Doll just kind of took the whole thing and. And what? And then the damning thing is, she looked back at Ryoko t- with the with the Michael Myers head tilt after taking that hit chair shot. Like, was that supposed to hurt? That crowd lost their damn mind the entire match. And if I remember, this was around the time where I think Ryoko was kind of winding down in her career. Yeah. Yeah, she was winding down at this point. Um, but she wanted to have one match with the woman with Mother because that was the one match their entire career people been wanting to see but never got a chance to see. And it was because of either injury or, or one thing or another. Yeah. But, um, the reason I brought up Demon Ryoko is because of my, is simply the fact that, like I said, she was like that sister figure to Inko. Yeah. She is the reason why Inko is who she is today. Because I talked about that before, where uh, when she came into the business, she was she was an idol. Mm-hmm. She fucking hated every bit of it. <laughs> she felt stuck, like she couldn't get out. She didn't like being an idol. She didn't like the practices. She didn't like the idea that they just wanted her to be this idol and be a rest. She liked the wrestling part. She hated the going to recording studios, going to recording studios to record, going to dance practice. She hated that shit. And what was so wild is that she had a natural beauty to her that most would kill to have in the idol scene, but she just didn't want to be it. And she was forced to be it. And she couldn't do nothing. Ryoko at some point saw all this, right? Because Ryoko had a reputation of being a protector mm-hmm. in the back. So she kind of saw this going on. And Ryoko's thing has always been whenever she took girls in on camera or whatever, she would just abuse the shit out of them, right? Yeah. She would just smack them in the head with the kendo stick to throw them back in the ring. Or she would, like, you know, slap them, open palm, slap them in the face. That was her way of showing affection. Yeah. So, what made Inko so unique and what got her down the path she had during her time as a wrestler is that they did this thing where she was getting abused and beat. And it was a tag team contest. It was Ink- it was Ryoko and one of the young girls from uh, the Atrocious Alliance mm-hmm. against Inko and Goddess Maya. Goddess Maya and Inko used to be a tag team. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would have matches. So one night this is, so one night um, they have the match. It gets to the point where it's Inko and Ryoko in the ring. And they have to pull those two. And what happened was, they do this thing where both Inko's partner and Ryoko's partner tag each other in because they don't want those two to face off, fight against each other because they're like, you're get, they're gonna try to kill each other, right? Because it got really, really personal. Yeah. So 
they tag each other in, they try to get into the ring, the referee's trying to get them out of the ring, and they're just staring at each other. And before you know it, Ryoko goes over to one of the girls, one of her girls, and she grabs a kendo stick. And not the regular gimmick kendo sticks you see now. These were the fully training sword kendo sticks that are thicker, right? Yeah. She grabs that from one of the girls and she slings it over to where Inko and Maya is. And she just points to Inko. Points to the kendo stick. And Inko staring at her just blank face. They both have blank faces. Inko grabs that kendo stick and blasts Maya in the back of the head with it. Oof. And before you know it, she just starts mauling the shit out of Maya. And she's beating the hell out of her and she's she she's not doing the regular slap. She's going closed fist on Maya. And opened her up hard way. And she, and it's one of the scariest things because now they're all like, what's going on? Huh, huh, huh. She's got little girls crying. Little girls that looked up to her crying. And she was laughing while beating my goddess Maya's head in. And then she looks at her hand. And she just proceeds to wipe the blood of Maya all over her face. And she's laughing. And she just looks like she's in the... she's she, And it's like one of those looks like... I've never felt more alive in my entire life type look. Yeah. And then... Ryoko... Walks over... And grabs the stick from her. Stares at Inko... And she pats Inko on the head. Inko gets up. At this point, one of the girls gets a chair, puts it in the middle of the ring. And they proceed to start shaving Inko's hair while Ryoko's cutting a promo saying, Your idol is a devil and she is mine you don't own her I do she's my rep she's my true rebel my right hand Inko is truly atrocious Gave her her own jacket with her patches and color and everything. And they walked out the ring together. This is when she still had the jet black hair, right? So they shaved half that shit off. When she came back the next show, fully blonde. Fully blonde, black lipstick, red and black eyeliner. Oh my god, she looked like a completely different person. She looked like an actual... uh, She looked like somebody that was part of an actual gang. Mm Mm-hmm. And it scared the hell out of people. And she... (laughs) And and for a while, I think for the first two months, people couldn't... didn't know what to really think about it. Because... They were so into the idol of what she was before that... Over time, they she had visceral hatred because they were like, "Do you not care about us? Do you not care about our feelings? You you betrayed us." You know that's how they felt. Inko was just having the time of her life. <laughs> and she became known as. And that's when she started getting a lot of the monikers. She started to become the anti-idol. The 
the the rebel, the hell rebel. The um, the princess of the true the true princess of despair, because she just loved to watch people cry and be sad over the things she did. I remember. <laughs> She did one press conference, and I think this was when she won the title after literally ripping the heart out of the entire audience because this was a triple threat with two of the biggest names. And Inko played upset by inserting herself into the match and then stealing the belt from ev- and then stealing the belt from the both of them. Which, funny enough, that's what, you know, they tried to attempt with um, Claudio, Sly, and Malik when Malik was champion the first time. Yeah. Did the, but uh, um, Inko did the same thing, except it was like a one-on-one, and then she inserted herself in the match halfway in and then stole it. Yeah. She walked in with all her members, Yoko right there, who gave her the, the big, you know, gave her her big push. She, she, uh... Walks in, just slings the belt on the table, and she goes into her jacket pocket and pulls out a flask and starts drinking while the cameras are just flashing and they're asking her questions. And she goes, I really love how people hate me. You'd think I'd be affected by it, but I'm not. I was born into this life, people hating me. I just grow I just grow to find it as a way of caring now. So continue to boo me. You're just showing me you love me. And and, and <laughs> And the thing was, they booed her because they just did not like her. They hated her. But, you know, they didn't know that. <laughs> so, yeah, Demon Ry- uh, Ryoko became one of the many reasons why Inko became who she is today. And old, she o- and Inko owes a lot to her. Um, She was there for her to the very end. Yeah. And, you know, before we did this, you know, I was talking with, and of course I was talking with Bobby and everything like that, and there, there's been one story that I think uh, I, I've, want, I've wanted to ask you about, um, but I know what, how how deep it is, and it does not have a happy ending. Um, so it's, it's the death of... Of Miguel White with oh yeah that's a... yeah so so I remember Bobby told me it was this this new startup company in Mexico uh, and they were doing like it was one of these first ever like big almost Olympic sized wrestling event and you had companies from all over the world you had grapple you know from Canada there was uh, Championship One Wrestling, from another company in Japan. There was Pro Wrestling, right. Pro Wrestling Rebellion, Maximum Impact Pro, uh, Golden Wrestling Central, uh, Grappling Arts Grand Prix, and there was just so many companies. And of course, at that time, um, it wasn't Super Japan; it was actually Super USA, which was the short-lived. Uh, your short-lived uh, Super Japan, short-lived um, American, uh, ex- you know, expansion. Uh, yeah. And some of the matches I I, I see on here, um, there's the the big main event of the show, which at that time was was very huge because it was uh, at that time Super USA World Heavyweight Champion Boulder Sterling taking on. Uh, one of Mexico's, actually not even Mexico, is actually uh, Japan. One of Japan's um, is actually I think. Let me see which one he wrestled with. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. So it was Championship One Wrestling, which was kind of Super Japan's rival company, anyways. It was the it was the it was the retirement match of Lion Max Two. Yeah, and that was one of the matches. Uh, Bobby was on the show himself. He took on El Fuego Fantasma. Uh, it was. I believe, yep, it was. It was for. It was to crown the crown of the first ever Lucha Star uh, middleweight champion. And then I see you and uh, Plucky. I think this was. I think this happened like this event happened like a month before your accident. And you took on, of course, <laughs> you took on those damn metal brothers again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nah, me, me and Plucky were fucking upset about that. We were like, can we? No, because here was the problem, right? Yeah. About that. You know how many times we fought him? Just that year alone? 13 fucking times. And and what Bobby told me, what why they did that a lot, is because cause you, cause you, cause your teams, because the Metal Brothers and you all had fantastic chemistry. Even though Bobby said, uh, the Metal Brothers were stiff as fuck. That's because they were willing to work with us. Yeah. And... They were willing to do shit with us because they liked us. And the problem was, we got where they were coming from and why they did with, you know, we got them. But everybody else was just like, they just had the shittiest chemistry with everybody else. Because it was either a whole lot of trying to establish dominance or one thing or another, or somebody, you know, getting a little too scared being in the ring with him and now they gotta feel like they gotta be alpha males and that don't that don't do shit except piss them off and so they put me and Plucky against them so many damn times and we're like oh come on <laughs> like we can take a beat and it's no problem but at that time I told you we did 13 fucking matches in one month and we were done and we had to do it again and we were like shit <laughs> Me and Plucky drunk extra hard that night because we were like, I don't want to remember this. <laughs> we were dumb. like, they're good guys. We're cool with them. They're fine. But God damn it. <laughs> you can only have the same match so many times until you're just like, can we fucking please get some, 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 some different, you know? But yeah, and of course, uh, Miguel also had a match here with El Leon Mystico, um, which was a rising star at that time in Mexico. And of course, you know, Miguel uh, being an established name in Super Japan and Super USA. Um, so, how, and also another match here, uh, uh, oh, another Taggart and Jackie match. Happened on this show as well. Tagger Jackie eight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so and is and this was a sh and this was a, like an event that took like I think it was like a week, almost like a week and a half, because there was just so many companies. Yeah. Like like like, like they wanted to make this like the wrestling Olympics. They literally had I think a f it was a five day event of yeah. just nonstop <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> Five days. Best payday I ever had. But there's a lot of... Like I said, there's a lot of... Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of darkness with that. So, from your memory, what what can you remember that transpired? Okay. So, the first thing I remember... It's not a secret. Uh, Miguel had a huge drug problem. And he was a bit of a live wire. A lot of a live wire. And he didn't know when to cut it off. He didn't know when to turn it back on either. So personally what happened, I remember. 
Um, so, first off, do you know, did you not know that that company was funded by the cartel? That that's what I was gonna ask you. Was I always heard that rumor, but I wanted to know if because you were one of the guys there, and it was. Yeah, that makes sense. It was, um, and we found out basically in probably one of the worst ways. So how we found out was we're in the back and we're getting ready and one of the guys who out and this guy comes in he's obviously not a security guy he's obviously not a he's not the booker he's not part of the booking team he's a he's a he's a new face we know everybody at that time, right? Because we got to meet everybody on the first day. All the promotions. Saw the people who... Here comes this guy with two women on his arm. Obviously what kind of woman they were. And... He's just like, God, look at all these... Look at all these big wrestlers. Ah, you know, he's... Making a fucking scene. What the fuck? All of a sudden... He's like, oh, don't mind. He's like, ah, hombre, don't mind me. He's like, we couldn't get into the other room, but they said I could be here. Ha <laughs> ha. He takes a corner. He goes into his pocket and pulls out a Ziploc bag, like a medium-sized Ziploc bag full of cocaine and puts that shit on the table. Oof. Already, I'm like, most people do that shit in private. Not way in, like, not out in the fucking public. What the fuck? You know? Yeah. And Miguel, being Miguel, he's just like, damn, that, is that kind of party? Fuck yeah. And we're like, and, and, and I remember Taggart pulled Miguel back on, mm -mm, the fuck? You know, Taggart's like, are you out of your fucking, no. You stay the fuck over here. Don't, because even Tiger had like a weird thing about that. Like he, some everything about that fell off. Yeah. And so, when the promoter, so when the Booker came in, he walks in, and he's like, "What the fuck are you doing?" Talking to the random fucking guy that came. He's like, "Hey, do that shit somewhere else." Not the fact that he was doing it. He's like, get the fuck out. He's like, do that shit somewhere else. And then they say some shit. Now they're speaking in Spanish. Not a lot of us get to speak Spanish. But Miguel is like multilingual. Yeah. That's some people didn't know. That man can speak about seven different languages. He hears what they're saying. And then the guy, and then they talk, and the guy that's with the girls and doing, he's talking, talking shit. Obviously, you can tell by the body language, and the promoter just bites his fucking tongue and leaves. Yeah, I'm going. What the fuck? Miguel pulls me, pulls like a lot of people up here, and he's just like, "Hey, that motherfucker said he's the son to. He said he said that motherfucker say he's the son to Gutierrez." I'm like, Gutierrez, like, who the fuck is Gutierrez? He's like, man, you ain't never heard of Mondo Gutierrez? The fucking head of the cartel? He said, that's the fucking cartel. That's just like, dude, that's the main dude's son. You know? Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck? And Miguel said, amigos, this shit being funded by the fucking cartel. Like, Miguel figured it out immediately who the fuck he was. Oof. Because, again, Miguel has a lot of connections in the drug world. Mm-hmm. So he, he knows people. And he had to be, he had to look a little bit like, oh, no, that motherfucker. And he said, that motherfucker looked familiar, you know? Now, he didn't snitch. He wasn't going to snitch. That was not going to be his thing. He was he was all like, oh fuck yeah, I'll go, I'll party with these guys, you know. Yeah. 
But we're trying to keep him from not doing that. Because now we're trying to contemplate. We're trying to contemplate the fact that, oh, fuck, we heard these rumors going around, right? By yeah. local, whenever we go to the bar. But to see that shit up close, and then to find out there was a point, I think, in Bobby's match, right? Yeah. They start fighting in the stands, and the security literally forces Bobby and him to go back down and not fight further up. Because those there were, like, press boxes with the fucking windows blacked out. Yeah. <laughs> well, we didn't know at the time those were actual drug trades going on. Oof. So they were keeping them away. And then all the shit, it's all of a sudden started to make sense. We were like, oh, fuck. So... We were stuck. Now here's the... About five of the promotions figured it out. The rest didn't know until... Until what happened to Miguel. Yeah. And then the aftermath behind it because... Uh, a lot of shit happened after that. And uh, I will get, I'll get to that. But what I remember mostly was that Miguel knew from the jump who that guy was because he could speak, he knew what they were saying yeah. in their native language and then when he got a good look at him he was like, that's the fucking head of the cartel's son and he just barged into this goddamn place and started doing cocaine in front of everybody and just, you know, didn't give a shit so around the three days around the first two, three days, we were fine right? Yeah. Everything was on the fourth, on the, on the uh, third to fourth night, that's where shit got a little problematic. Oh shit! Third night, we all go out after after we all go out. We're having drinks. We're having a good time. Mm-hmm. Miguel, on his usual day, said, "Fuck it, we're gonna go further." You know. Mm-hmm. So Miguel brings out the they he brings out. The Colombian snow. Oof. That he bought from cartel. Now we're there. Because in his mind, he's like, oh, fuck, easier way to get my shit. Yeah. So, um, we're uh, doing our usual. All of a sudden, um, from what I remember, Miguel was uh, he was hitting on this uh, girl and the girl was feeling only to find out that was uh, that was uh, Gutierrez's daughter he was hitting on Oof. he didn't know at the time And the, the same kid, right? From yeah. The, he tried to be all big and bad to Miguel. And say, you know, are you fucking with my sister? You know, called him every horrible thing known to man. Uh, Marty Cohn was used at one point. Which, uh, I'm not going to tell you what that is. But he called him all sorts of things. Miguel wasn't taking it. Like, he knew who that was, but at the same time, he was just like, I'm not about to let some little smart mouth little fuck talk shit about me, you know? Because, like I said, the one thing about Miguel is, like, he had a short fucking fuse. And it was shorter when he was high. And when he was off his... When he was on planet fucking Pluto. Mm -hmm. After doing two lines. He zooted. Before I know it, Miguel fucking headbutts the shit out of him. And he goes down. We pull... He gets pulled away. And we... And we're trying to get him away from the situation before it gets more... It escalates more. And the girl is like... Oh my god, like, she, like and the girl he was in on goes running to him 
to the to her brother. Again, Miguel doesn't even know that's the sibling. He finds out later, and he's just like, he just shrugs it off, like, oh well, you know. Mm -hmm. But what I remember when we were getting back to the hotel, I remember that because we all have like special buses, right? Yeah. I remember we were being tailed coming back to the hotel. I'm thinking, well, I just found out, or a good chunk of us just found out that the cartel is basically putting money into this event. Maybe this is the DEA, maybe this is the CIA just staking out the arena. That's what I'm thinking, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, it was Gutierrez's men. I and Miguel. Because word got out what the fuck happened. So, the first time after that show, after what happened at the bar, they find out where Miguel is at with everybody else. Then they then go to the main guy, tell him what happened. And then from that day, following up to the night, we were being tailed and didn't know and thought it was you know they were tailing Miguel from that night the following day up until they could catch him at the they could catch him when he didn't have anybody around him yeah <clears throat> so They uh, waited until he got finished with the show. And I remember he he went, hey, amigos, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna go to the hotel. And they're like, you're not going to party? Nah. I'm a little too busted up because he got, he got fucked up real bad in that match. Yeah. So he was like, Nah, I'm a little sore. I'm on the hotel. And, uh, Taggart said, take some of the boys with you. And he's like, I'll be fine. He's like, no, take some of the boys with you because they got to go too. Because, you know, these are the young boys. And Taggart basically told him, you know, uh, go with your, go with, go with him. Make sure he gets where he needs to go. Make sure he gets to the hotel room. Yeah. Because Tagger was being a babysitter for, for Miguel that entire night because Miguel got a little too crazy on, on the snow. And so he, he had to make sure. He was going to make sure that he really got there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, everything's fine. You know, we go out. We celebrate another good night. Paychecks, crazy. We're celebrating with everybody. Everybody's losing their shit. And they're like, yeah, you know, here's to the night. Last, last night, you know. Because we were all ready to just go back to our places. I, I heard the uh, that uh, the Lion Mask 2 Boulder Sterling match was very emotional. Because, it was. Yeah, because I know that was Lion Mask 2's uh, final match. Yeah. Uh, because they were since the first day they were trying to tell him are you sure you want to retire are you sure are you sure they were asking him because they were praying he didn't want he wasn't going to really retire mm -hmm. they didn't want him to retire and deep down line mass didn't want to retire either but he had no choice he had to for his own health And so, when that match happened, yeah, it was very emotional. There was not a single dry eye in the audience, and hell, there was not a dry eye in the back. Yeah. Because we knew how much he really loved wrestling, but he couldn't do it anymore. Like, his body would not let him continue. So, it was an emotional day. We celebrated like hell for him. We 
gave him our we gave him we you know we gave him he he, he left out there with a bunch of gifts a bunch of memories and uh that was probably one of the few and I and I've always said this two emotional things happened that night one was of pure joy and the other one was out of misery and and, and tragedy yeah so all that went down and that's when the night went on we got back to the hotel around 1.30 in the morning and by the time we were there I get a phone call and it's Bobby Bobby's like have you seen Miguel and the reason he asked me was because I was on the same floor as him yeah he's like did you see like did you see Miguel at any point I go no I haven't and he's like well somebody should go check on him cause you know we're here but we gotta make sure he didn't like go out and try to hitch a, a ride to Tijuana to do some crazy shit you know so I was like alright so I put on my fucking boots and I go back and I go out and I walk his room was at the oh god did you, did you go alone no yeah. no I didn't Plucky was with me okay cause me and Plucky shared a room and I said Plucky come with me he goes Right. <sighs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm still, I feel like it was yesterday. <sighs> uh, he, his room was like, wait, his, so my room, I'm picturing it for you, so my room was the third room when you walk, when you walk from the elevator. Yeah. His room was at the very end of the hall. And these are very long calls. So his room is at the very end of the hall. So I'm walking. And I, for the life of me, I could not shake this dreadful ass feeling I was having. I, I don't know. Jason, with the life of me to this day, I couldn't tell you why the fuck I felt the way I felt. But man, I did not feel good when I was walking down that hall. And Pluckett is just talking my ear off. And he's like, man, you know, I think you and Bobby are paranoid, you know. I, he's going to be all right. He's probably just sleeping it off. We go. When we get to the room, first thing we see, the door's open. Oh, there. No, the door wasn't open. The door was like, like somebody broke the damn thing. Yeah. But it was, it was still closed enough. But we checked. I was like, Plucky immediately grabbed my hand and told me, don't open that door any further. And Plucky and me were like, and so I remember Plucky just kind of, you know, checked his feet where he was at. Because you know how back then the doors didn't have any blockers at the bottom. So you could see, so you would see you know yeah so plucky made sure his feet was nowhere near the openings by uh, under the door he just put his ear to just to hear something was going on we heard silence we hear shit so we go and he slowly creeps the door open we look in there It looked like a tornado went through that fucking place. The place got ransacked. It got destroyed. And then we notice blood on the walls where McGill's bed was. And we were like, oh no. 
immediately. We we get we come out of the room. I'm every part of my body is saying run. Plucky is like grabs me by my arm and says we're gonna come and walk out of here. Don't make a scene. And so we do. I'm having images in my head and now I'm like I'm freaking the fuck out at this point. So we call Tagger. Because at this point we always call Tagger if it, if we if anything Miguel related goes on. Because Tagger because it was either Tagger uh it was either Tagger or I think I heard Boulder was kind of a baby serotonin too. Yeah, it was either Taggart or Boulder or um, or Kiyosama. Yeah. Who was our who was the who was the head of Super Japan, who always also looked after Miguel. Yeah. I couldn't fucking get Boulder. Kiyosama was like Kiyosama was at another hotel. And he was gone from everybody. So Taggart was the next best option. I called Taggart. I said, Taggart, did any of the young boys call you up yet? And Taggart said, I haven't heard. What's, I was, he's like, no, they haven't. Why? I said, Taggart, Miguel's not in his room. The fuck you mean he's not in his room? I said, Taggart, he's not in his room. And Taggart's ready to go, God damn it, that's something. Like, he was ready to be like, that son of a bitch lied on us. You know. Yeah. I, I then say, Tagger. I couldn't get the words out. I was, cause I was dreading it. You know. Yeah. I'm like, Tagger. Somebody bust him into this room. There's blood on the walls. That's all I can get out. I hear, I hear nothing on the line. And then I hear the dial tone. Five minutes later, Tagger comes bold, comes barreling down the hall. He comes barreling down the hall with his fucking dirty hairy revolver. Bust in the room. Bust in the same room where Miguel is at. And he's looking around. He comes back out that room. He's like, where the fuck is he? I'm like, we don't know. After that, he's like, you two come with me. We go down to the receptionist. He goes to the receptionist. He goes, ma'am, did a man named, and he uses Miguel's name. He goes, did a man named Miguel White come in at this time? You know, he was talking. Like, he was just basically needling her for information. And he goes, did you see any other two men with him? You know? Yeah. And she's like, he came in around... He, like he came in around eleven thirty, you know, and and uh, like in the in the boy and his his two friends was there with them too, the young boys. Yeah. And then he, she said, um, then he went out, and he says, then around twelve he went with some men, you know. It's like at yeah, twelve he he left with two men. Like he left with two men, and he goes, "Was it the? He says, was it his friends?" She goes, "No, they look different, you yeah. know." Yeah. So, apparently, and then she said, after a few minutes, the others came running to follow them. So what happened was. What happened? They caught him when he was trying to relax. Yeah. And they gave him a choice. They tortured one of the guys. And he was and the woman said one of them, one of his friends, looked a little hurt, like he just got into a fight. Remember when I said blood there was blood on the walls? Yeah. Yeah, one of them was punching the other so damn hard that blood was splattered. Fuck. 
He was torturing them to get Miguel to go with them. These were Gutierrez's men. They caught him. And they were going to make him pay for her. And Gutierrez wanted him to pay for hurting his son. Yeah. So he said, you got two options here. You can die in this hotel, you can, or you can die what we tell you to die. And he was putting up a fight, but they basically made him go with them. And then the others were trying to... And these two kids... started to uh, follow him. Because they were trying to... They were trying to help Miguel. Yeah. Raphael Warden. Yeah. And Shiragumo Toya. They were just two kids trying to make it into this business. And on that night, they tried to protect somebody. They tried to protect their senior. No one told them to follow those yeah. guys. No one told them. But they wanted to, out of loyalty and to protect Miguel, they they followed him <clears throat> um, Tiger put in a re- police report and uh, the police were fucking useless. Yeah. Until we told them of the incident and then they were like and it goes uh, dagger it is it? No man. He's like listen sir I don't know whether you want to hear this or not but uh, if he's got some next to kin you might as well start notifying for funeral arrangements. That man dead. Oof. Tiger, Tiger was about to kill him. Like he was. I said, mm-mm. We, and he's just like, you mean to tell me you? He's like, you, so you ain't gonna do nothing. He goes, what can we do? Well, it's like we can search for him, but he ain't gonna be alive. This was a police officer telling him this. Yeah. Cause he knew. And apparently it's the same tactics they've used before. So, uh, they went to searching. And after, let's see, we got back at around 1.30. Mm-hmm. 7 to 8 in the morning. The police find Miguel. Oof. Well, yeah, they, they find part of him anyway. Oh, fuck. They find a body in a. They f- there was a local swimming pool. Mm hmm. They found Toya's and. Raphael in, in the in the changing rooms. Yeah. Fucking throat slit from ear to ear. Oh god. And then they find Miguel. They find Miguel's body at the bottom of the pool. And when they pulled him up, they realized it was just Miguel's body. He didn't have his head, did he? 
No. Fuck. They found the head. They found his head um, four miles down from the pool. Oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah. So. We were all. The. The real fucked up part about it was just how emotionally detached the police were about it. Yeah. Because they were so used to it. And we're. And. I remember. I don't know who it was, but they just said, how. Fuck you, be so calm about this. Our fucking friend just got, you know. Police officer looked at him with these tired ass eyes and he goes, he goes, a decapitation around here is the equivalent of a stabbing. This isn't the first one. He said, and you may not want to hear this, but your friend got off lucky. He was dead before they even they, he was dead before they even cut his head off. Because by reports, they basically already he was already dead when they got him. Yeah. Like they killed him there. He was already dead. I think what it I, I couldn't even tell you. To this day I don't know how what they did, but I do know that's how he was found. Yeah. And that's how the other two were found. And Taggart, uh, Taggart doesn't get emotional too much. I went to Taggart's house a few times, right? Yeah. He has a picture of literally everybody. He has a picture of all the kids he trained. He has a picture of Jackie. He has a picture of his wrestling family. He's got a picture of Pretty Boy. He's got a picture of everybody. But they're like, but he does not have a picture of Miguel. He, uh, he says, remember he said, he says, I'm too, he's like, I can't look at his face. It's the guilt that eats him up, you know? Yeah. He says, I can't look at his face and I can't look at their face either. Because he felt immeasurably guilty. Because like, he, he, I mean, he felt that he basically led those two to their death. And um, Boulder didn't take it the best either. In fact, it was that moment that Boulder felt like I'm... It, it was that moment where Boulder was like, fuck it, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, he was pretty much done with wrestling. Yeah. He checked the fuck out. Like he didn't want to. He didn't want to do this anymore. He didn't want to be a wrestler anymore. It, it killed everything about him. Because as much as Miguel had problems, Boulder really cared for him. Mm -hmm. And Miguel cared for a lot of people. You know, no, he didn't care much for himself. He cared for a lot of people. But yeah, that night is like it was a feel good, sad moment. For Lion Mask, but then what you know people don't realize is that that was also the night where Boulder Sterling quit wrestling, and Miguel White was brutally killed, and two kids who had a promising future died in the process too, for simply just being there with Miguel. Well, another another thing I, I, I hear and this is what Bobby told me I think it was like I think it was like two years after the incident somehow they uh, that I heard that Miguel's mother received the package 
and it had a note on it that said here's the rest of them and it was his ear yeah fuck yeah no she did um and then I hear right after that I heard Taggart got her moved far the fuck away from that that place he moved her to a different country yeah I'm not gonna tell you where I won't tell you where yeah because she's still being looked she when I tell you that son of a bitch still tries to have her followed I fucking mean it like He had to move her to another country. Yeah. And he, he didn't tell nobody. He just said, they just heard about her. And he goes, don't worry, she's, she's not there anymore. And we're like, where? I'm not telling y'all. What do you mean? I'm not telling y'all. And y'all better not fucking find her. I refuse to let somebody innocent die. He said, I refuse to let another innocent person die. Fuck that. Like he he got police he got authorities. I remember he actually had authorities and the CIA themselves try to like move her out and basically make a new identity for her. She doesn't even have she's she doesn't even have her own like she. They basically put her in the equivalent of a witness protection. Yeah. They gave her a new identity, a new everything because the fact that they found her address and know who she was when Miguel pretty much made sure that nothing of his, nothing of his past could come back to link her was scary as fuck yeah so yeah moved her away and i uh if you go down to mexico especially in that little area mhm mm there is a there is a mural, a graffiti mural, and I don't know if you can call it tasteless, but there's like there's one where it's just Miguel, yeah, with the angel wings and the halo. Further down, in the worst parts, there is a graffiti mural of Miguel. Mm hmm. Prayer hands, and he's headless. <sighs> and I don't know what to tell you. It's it, it's pretty symbolic in a way. Yeah. How people thought about him. On one hand, yeah, he was a bad person. I mean, yeah, he he was a he was a he was a coke fiend who got, who was too much of a live wire and had a lot of demons. Yeah. But damn it, nobody deserved that. No one, no one deserves deserves that. Uh, and I think I, I think after that, I think Lucha Star never had another event after that. No, because um, the aftermath went as follows. The aftermath was that the promoter ended up being arrested. And basically it led to Gutierrez being captured because he basically he went on and said no bank would endorse what no bank wanted to do this so I had to get my money somewhere. I went to him and he also went I had to continue this while he was performing his basically the Lucha event was a front yeah for his practices and dealings and he said I had to he was going to kill my family if I didn't and they were like well why did you go to him in the first place he goes these fucking banks wasn't going to give me a loan. These banks wasn't going to do... He had no choice. He was desperate, right? Yeah. So he ended up turning on Gutierrez and got him arrested. And Motherfucker was in Colombia. 
the entire time, but he was just, you know, putting out calls. Yeah. But he ended up blabbing. Uh, he snitched on Gutierrez, got him arrested. Gutierrez ended up getting killed in a raid. Um, the guy in question served about 15 years, and he was almost going to serve life. Yeah. Because they were trying to pin the murders on him. They're trying to pin Miguel's murders on him. Mm -hmm. And we were like, no. The motherfuckers that murdered him were Gutierrez's his men, so pin him on them. But he ended up getting prison time. Um, the, the Obviously, the, the, the place folded afterwards, and a lot of the workers, a lot of the wrestlers there just went on to other places. Some were tired. Some didn't just some didn't just want to wrestle anymore because they felt that there was bad choo choo after all that. I heard because Bobby won the Lucha Star middleweight title. I heard he threw he threw that belt away. Yeah, and mostly because Baby Doll said, "Don't." Mostly because Baby Doll said, "You are not gonna keep that damn thing in my house." Yeah, because she because she was like, "There's some bad vibes off that thing now." No. She actually, uh, I say it's not to be funny, but she actually got an ordained priest to come to their house and do a cleansing. Yeah. Because she just didn't feel right with that bill, especially with the, with what was, you know. Yeah. But yeah, no, that, it's a, it, it was a, a lot of, the aftermath of it is what was more impactful than the actual show now nowadays. Whatever happened to uh, Gutierrez's son? If you know anything that ever happened to him. I don't know what happened to him, honestly. Hmm. All I know is that his father was murdered yeah. in the raid. Because, uh, one of the CIA members got a really good idea. Mm -hmm. And they, he got killed in a raid. And that's a conspiracy because they said, oh, he tried to kill the CIA first, but the CIA fired first. You know? Yeah. It, it, it was like a Waco tech. It was like the Waco situation, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. His son... His son fled... He's not in Mexico. He's somewhere in in, so in El Salvador. He's he's either in El Salvador. He's in Spain. What I do know is that he also changed his identity, and he and you'll never find him. Yeah. His little girl. She would hurt. Her, the little girl she still is around mm -hmm. oh now she gets a lot of shit mm -hmm. but the one thing her father did right by her in a way was that she basically made millions off of she made a book and she's made millions off of him in that way Yeah, and she uses that money uh, for charity. Last I remember, she sold off the house. The house they all lived in. That very same house where the raid happened. Yeah. She got like $2.1 billion for it. So she's living really... She's living well off. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that's a story I think a lot... A lot of people have heard about. Ever, uh, anytime we do mention Super Japan, we do mention Miguel, and that always does get brought up. And I think now knowing the story, you know, people truly know how dangerous this this business could be on the business side of things. Because, because yeah, you can you can go to these places, these far off places but sometimes there's there's bad people around and and you gotta be careful 
yourself. If you're your own worst enemy and you come in with an, a certain attitude, that, that'll that happen to you. You know, and, I don't want us to end on a sad note. Huh. So, and and I know he retired and everything like that, but and I also know that the son of a bitch ended up marrying uh, Inko's sister, and he's your brother-in-law. Oh, uh, can you tell us some uh, some Boulder Sterling stories? <laughs> no, that's fucking hell. You want to know the funny part about that? What? She didn't fucking know. Remember what I said? A lot of Inko's family kind of disowned her. Mm-hmm. And the only one that kind of was like cordial to her was her, was her sister. Right? Yeah. So. How they met is the, the, the craziest thing. <laughs> I think yeah this was around the time Boulder was just gonna wind down on wrestling he didn't want to wrestle no more especially after that so we're um, we're just in the back we're in the locker room mm-hmm. and uh, I'm playing blackjack with the guys Boulder's there too and Keo comes to the door and he's like hey yo and Keo jumps like, Jesus, what? <laughs> you know? and he's like, uh, is it possible if I have my match in the middle of the card instead of the end of the card? I got a, I got a date tonight. And I got a, I was like, I got a date tonight. <laughs> and Keo looked at him. Just gave him this look. Like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, come on!" And he's like, "Oh, come on! You owe me all those." He's like, "All those things I did for you, I'm just asking for one thing, you know." <laughs> and he's like, "Fuck!" He's, he's like, "He's like, fine, match in middle." And so Boulder goes in, has his match. The match was only five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking ate the kid up, and then went, and then you know took his shower and went to fu- and went and went on his merry way. Meanwhile, at this point, I'm done because I already had my match. Yeah, me and Plucky had like a real short one, so I'm going. So I decide. So Inko's like, "Hey, uh, do you- I just got finished. My sister called me." And she wants me to, and she wants me to meet her new boyfriend. Will you go with me? <laughs> I, I don't know if I can deal with this. I'm like, yeah, sure. So, this is around the time people didn't know me and Inko were dating. Mm-hmm. So I finish up my shit. Tell Plucky I see him. And I'm walking. And then, you know, then there's Inko waiting for me. And it's at a steakhouse. And I'm like, why are you nervous? You know, she's just, she's just like, I don't know. It's like, my sister's kind of, she's like, my sister just never had the best taste in guys. <laughs> you know? She's like, last time I literally, she's like, because, no, the last time she, like her sister dated somebody. Inko almost went to jail because she grabbed the nearest Jack Daniels bottle, broke it, and threatened to gut him from his neck to his dick. <laughs> um. So we get to the steakhouse, and there's Inko, and there's her sister, and there's there's there she is, and it's like. They talk, and she goes, where's the guy? It's like, oh, he just went to the bathroom. He should be here. And then she, then her sister looks at me, and she goes, I didn't know you hung out with him. And it goes like, yeah, yeah, we just hang out. He's my friend. Da-da-da. You know? Yeah. 
Like she again, she don't tell nobody. <laughs> so we just sitting waiting. And she tells me, because she always likes me to do this. She just like just start being yourself. She kind of whispers in my ear, just start being yourself. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, start being Ray and Ray. So I'm like, bartender! Bar-. I'm like, garçon, give me a Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and it's a little Japanese waitress, too. And I'm like, and it's like, like, appreciate it. Give her a, a quick smack on the ass. <laughs> I bet he go slap the shit out of you afterwards. <laughs> no, she laughed. Oh. <laughs> no, she laughs at that shit because she likes when I'm like the like because that was what she we would do. Mm-hmm. But to play up the fact that we were just like two aliens. Yeah. We just be rambun I just be I just be the loud fucking abrasive ass guy who just does shit and I scare the fuck out of the out of the little tiny Japanese women, and <laughs> there's Inko sitting there just laughing my, her ass off, like, and she just like grab a fucking, or she just drinks what I drink, and she just tells the fucking bartender, "Hey, more," you know. <laughs> and her sister is like, "You know, you ain't got to put that act up, right?" Because her sister is like smart enough to know that it's just an act, and Inko's like, "Nah, it's fun." We're waiting. All of a sudden, I see I see Boulder, <laughs> and Boulder sits down next to her, and I'm like, "God damn it!" <laughs> I, I bet, I I bet he nearly shit himself. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> "Fun fact: Boulder is fucking terrifying." Me. <laughs> and he's like oh shit uh, he looks at her and goes uh, <clears throat> baby who's this Inko says baby <laughs> <laughs> I had to keep her from jumping over the table. I'm like, mm, 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 mm. and she just like, <laughs> she goes, Mayuki, what? So I was like, she's like, Yuki, what does he mean by baby? And she's like, oh, <laughs> this is my new boyfriend. <laughs> I bury my face in the fucking table <laughs> to stop from laughing. While meanwhile, I got the strongest grip on Inko, cause I know Inko wanted to fucking kill him. Cause Boulder, <laughs> when it comes to women, <laughs> Boulder tends to be a little bit of a skirt chaser. Mm-hmm. He's what we like to call Mr. Pinch Ass. You know? <laughs> if he can take if he could take five home with five women home with him, he would. That's what Boulder was. And Inko <laughs> Never in my life ha- has Inko reverted to like the the mother. She went absolutely fucking not. <laughs> and she's like but you just I know what kind of person he is absolutely fucking not in fact is this number is this number two out of the five like this is Inko asking bull. he's like well, well I haven't been dating anybody he's like and then Inko's like wait this is your sister and he and, she, and Inko said Inko called him by his real name <laughs> she would she never calls him Boulder she either says Sterling or she calls him by his real name oh yeah um fuck 
I've always known him as Boulder. Uh, Cause he, <laughs> cause he's always kept his real his real first name like secret. Yeah, no, his name is uh, his real name is um, his real name is uh, Solomon. Oh yeah, Solomon, S- Solomon Sterling. Yeah, so she's like Solomon or Sully. <laughs> yeah, which is funny. And that's where Mike Sullivan or Sully. That's where Mike. Uh, Mike Sullivan and Wiki gets the Sully from. Yeah. But it's worded differently. Um, she looks at him and she goes, Sterling, you got about five. You got. I'm going to give you to the count of five to walk out of this steakhouse and never talk to my sister again. Or I will go to jail right here, right now. <laughs> And he's like, whoa, 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 late, listen, and he's trying to explain himself. He's like, Inko, I promise you, I really do love your sister. I Like, we've been together for, t-. like, he, he blabbed. I swear to God, he folded so fucking hard. So apparently they were dating for five months. <laughs> And they really, really love each other. And Inko is getting more and more pissed the more she hears about this. And then it led to the point where while she's angry, they notice here I am trying to not laugh. Covering my face. And then, Boulder goes, what's Ray doing here? (laughs) Ink goes like, don't change the subject. What are your fucking intentions for my sister? You you lech. Never heard he go call anyone a lech before. <laughs> and that did that did me in. I choked. I started cry- I started guffaw. Like I was <laughs> wheezing. I'm causing a commotion. You know who I am. And Inko staring at me. And I just look at him like I'm sorry, this shit's hilarious. She's like, do you want to die too? I'm like, it's funny! You can't be mad at me at this! <laughs> and then it gets into an argument with me and her. And then her sister goes, I knew it! And she's like, what are you talking about? I knew you two were together! <laughs> <laughs> And Boulder stares at me, uh, and Inko's like, I don't know what you're talking about. She goes, I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, you two bicker like a married couple. I knew you two were together. (laughs) And then Boulder went, oh my god. You're dating CBI? (laughs) <laughs> for those that don't know what CBI means, that's the abbreviation for Crazy Bitch Inko. <laughs> Which is what a lot of the wrestlers in Japan, both male and female, started calling her because of her antics outside of the wrestling ring. Inko doesn't mind when somebody calls her that. But because she just does not like Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> and because Boulder is a bit of a lecturous poon hound. <laughs> like, like, I shit you not. <laughs> he used to be the worst at this shit. Do you know that he only went to the Joshi shows not because he liked the wrestling, but because he was thinking who he could take home that night? Oh, God. Like... It didn't matter if the girl could probably kick his ass. He'd be like, ooh, yes, challenge. Like, that is Boulder. 
<laughs> he even tried to get into Foxy Foxy's pants one time. <laughs> it ended horribly for him, but he tried. So when I tell you, Eco <laughs> was so not for him. She lit. She wasn't, and she was like, "Do you not know that this man is a is a is a skirt chaser? Like he's a le- he's lecherous. Like she's telling tell her he's lecherous. He cheats on women. Like before you know, it, he's gonna start bringing four women home. You don't want that." You know, and she's like, and she goes, he used to be like that. He's not anymore. He's told me he's, he was honest, but he hasn't been like that. And in, in a year, you know, trying to like, he's, ch- he's a changed guy. And maybe if you stop judging him, you get to know him more, you know. <laughs> oh, her little sister did not back down from her. And... After a while, it was like, <laughs> and then she changed the subject. And then she goes, "Well, how long you and how long and you and the loudmouth been dating? Talking about me? <laughs> I'm like, stick. I'm like, hey, keep me out of this. <laughs> and so both of them." Like, and then after a while, we both, like, ate. And it's the most awkward, silent co- dinner I've ever been at. And me and Bur- and me and, uh, me and Boulder are, like, staring at each other. <laughs> and so he just asked me an honest guy question. He goes, how the hell did you get that? <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, how the hell are you dating the sister to that? <laughs> and he's like I promise that I didn't know I didn't know that that was Inko's sister like if it was I was like what you wouldn't date her is that what you're telling me cause I was testing him and he's like no I still wouldn't date her but I didn't know that was Inko's sister I'm like <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like well if you decide you're going to stay with her, you going to have to deal with that a lot. <laughs> and if you leave her, Inko will hunt your ass down to the ends of the earth. <laughs> I said, so you're fucked either way. And he's like, what, and you're not? I said, listen, she likes me. She puts up with me. She don't like you. <laughs> And we all know why she don't like you. <laughs> he couldn't fucking win. <laughs> he couldn't. <laughs> but he... But, but by God, he uh, he really did love her. And, uh... And not, <laughs> and not too long ago, their, their son actually... Uh, yeah, your nephew Nick Sterling actually debuted uh, in America not too long ago. He did. <laughs> Inko loves the hell out of him. Inko loves the hell out of him. <laughs> hates the shit out of. Hates the shit out of Boulder though. <laughs> loves the fuck out of Nick. <laughs> that is never gonna change. <laughs> <laughs> She said. She said one time. She said, "I will go to my grave. I will go to my grave, wishing death on you. I want you to know that." <laughs> Probably said that at their wedding too. No, she said that when he proposed to her. <laughs> he said, "She's like, I. I don't care if I'm if I'm old and dying. I want you to know that I love everything of your existence, and if you ever at any point." hurt my sister, if I even see a marking of a bruise on her, I know people. You will disappear. (laughs) (laughs) 
Ingo could put the fear of God into the biggest of men, and the boulder was already an opposing looking motherfucker, but man, he'll tell you, the only thing in this world he feared was Ingo. <laughs> You know what I, I I think I think after hearing what we heard earlier, this this is how you end a podcast episode. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh my god. Oof. Ah, Solomon, it's all good. You know you you know it's all good. Oh boy, but yeah, that is the end of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all. For for joining us. Um, we will see you next time here at a studio warehouse, my backyard. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, don't know, we'll probably get some special guests here. Who knows? Uh, but I'll see you all, we'll see you all next time for, for Jason Brown and Raging Ray Jackson. We say good night. Good night, everyone.